it's really, really good timing for us to be able to kind of um, come and present here on a couple of fronts. Uh, partly because of some of the work that we've been involved with the National Sector Development Initiative. And so part of my stuff today, if it's okay, is to give everyone a little bit of an update on some of those things. It's a lot of stuff that's sort of been in development for a long time and not very publicly visible. It's now becoming a bit more public or very shortly. So I'm going to kind of give everyone a heads up on that and get hopefully some feedback and input into that process um, as part of the work today. Um, I'm not going to do so much stuff on feral arts or my own personal background, but I will kind of add in a little story after the fantastic presentation this morning. Um, my inspiration stuff, I'm going to just talk about a couple of uh, examples of things that are going on at the moment. And they're kind of, um, they're not explicitly part of the community arts and corporate development sector. That's part of the reason I'm kind of bringing them into the mix, just kind of that idea of expanding horizons and seeing you know, what's on the edges and where's this sector, how's it connecting with other things. And most of my time will be about future of CSED, challenges and opportunities, the NSDI stuff, and the digital platform stuff, and this development of the organisation for Creative Australia. Um, we're really pleased to be uh, lucky enough to be one of the companies who made it through the process of getting a gig to be a key producer company again with the Australia Council. That support is incredible. Um, and there's a kind of a big responsibility on those companies to do. Uh, a bit more in terms of leadership and development and trying to support stuff, so it's great as Country kind of Arts is doing today. But also, kind of to <coughs> mention and recognise all the arts and companies who don't have that level of support and, um, and realise that there's still a hell of a lot of work to do kind of, to grow that um, envelope a bit and, uh, and to bring out companies into those processes. Particularly, I think, and I'll come back to this later, but I want to you know, see that this relationship between the states and the feds at the moment is really tricky. There's a, a lot of odd stuff going on. And we're going to have a bit of conversation about that and see what we as a sector want to say about those things. As a program storytelling in the public interest, um, it's kind of the second six year block of that. It's, a, as we say, an incredible privilege to be able to focus a piece of work around that kind of time frame. And everyone here knows how important the kind of long term approach and that investment is, and also the responsibilities it brings. Our, our idea of storytelling is incredibly broad. It's really about whatever community brings to the communication process, and we learn about that every day. But we're really kind of interested in um, the idea of um, supporting communities to make the best possible use of their stories, and trying to think about what that means in the digital age. So most of our, most of our working focus is, is digital. Um, we have a very small team at Feral Arts as part of us. Um, we employ full-time programmers, software programmers, that's their art form. Um, we've been employing programmers for 15 years now, and um, that's kind of obviously an area of interest of ours as well, about promoting digital technologies and new media and thinking about software programming as another language. I mean, Bong's going to play so that this is I'm sure. Um, part of our work is developing software systems, and this is one of the ones we've been working on. I think the first version of this came out in 2001 and gets rewritten. So it's a kind of gets a process. It gets rewritten and rebuilt through community use all the time. The main kind of development process is us putting stuff out there, people using us, us learning from that, rebuilding it and making it better. And um, I want to kind of, before I end on this, I want to tell one little story about my own background and, and, and feral arts. We've been running for about 25 years now, and some of the really early work that we were doing and the connections we still have is with a really small um, indigenous community in northwest Queensland, maybe 150, 200 people, Dajara, the sort of south of Mount Isa, sort of inland from the territory border, but really all the territory people that, um, uh, you know, living in Queensland, which, you know, is the most massive of times. Um, and I trained as a documentary maker at the University of Southern like and had teamed up with Sarah Moynihan and Feral Arts and another team of artists who were delivering these incredible multi arts programs of music and visual arts. And so I was bringing video making and film and stuff into it, which I worked out with that bit. And uh, bringing kind of a whole lot of conventional ideas of what documentary making was into that community context. And I remember this well, quite early on in that process, we got involved in making a documentary with. The Jajara community about issues there, about water and access to land and hunting rights and all those sorts of things. 
but we'd spent a couple of weeks doing it. And then on the weekends, we'd be living in the community, but so shagged that we couldn't really do anything other than sleep. And groups of young people would come in and grab the equipment and go off and use it and come back. And um, this group of 10-year-old kids had sort of followed our footprints around the community and sort of remade the documentary stuff that we were doing. And then watching their footage, like, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not saying we're the worst of community breakers in the world, but like we're we're up there, and like these kids have just nailed it. They've gone in um, and kind of with point of view, with comedy, with uh, I really wish I'd put some of the clips to show you. But it's I'll put some online. And but what they've done through their insight and and also the fact that they have the relationships with people, they can have conversations that you know, we couldn't have. All the same, all of those sort of things that we all know. And so what, you know, from what I sort of understood from that and probably is, you know, one of my main inspirations, obviously, is the communities that we work with. But just getting to understand, well, it's not about me coming in as a storyteller, it's about what we can do to enable communities to tell their own stories, and with those technologies. So that's really been, kind of a lot of our work through the software development has been unpacking what documentary making is, and making those tools available to communities in different ways. So, Anyway, we're going in lots of different directions. But <clears throat> so these two couple of quick examples I want to share. Uh, everyone probably knows Bengara, the dance company who've been doing amazing main stage work for a long time. A lot of the um, dancers who are not performing any longer but have incredible artistic skills have started to do um, a range of other projects, particularly this one called Rekindling. And you won't see much about this publicly because it's all happening pretty much privately in communities at the moment. And it will start to have more of a profile in the years ahead. But essentially, this is about those dancers going, connecting with communities around storytelling and dance, and connecting out, reconnecting adults and, and young people in the community. Long-term work, and like a really interesting kind of connection, I think, for us to see a, a mainstream company coming in working with community processes in lots of ways. Now, our involvement with this work, I might just skip out of this for a second and go off to a website if that's going to work for me. Um, and not that one. This is the main Bangara site. And uh, this community is all private on the, in the place where it's So, uh, and we've kind of had to completely rebuild and redesign our systems to enable us them by using more mobile phone technology rather than computers and things like that because pretty much all the kids in the community are only using mobiles. Um, and essentially what they've been doing is going around to the whole stack of communities. Initially in, um, initially in New South Wales last year, but they're doing another round of um, New South Wales uh, based projects this year in four different communities and then four again in, um, in Queensland and then building that momentum as they go. And just want to throw it out there as something, and we'll, we'll come back to it later in the day. There's lots of other examples, I think, too, of that um, uh, major companies really engaging community space. And so I think the kind of boundaries or the connections between those things are changing. So it's one of the things on a flag, something for us to talk about as we go through stuff. And essentially, they're just doing some lovely kind of community engaged work through dance and storytelling. And then they're going to document that journey as they go through it. And connect it with these incredibly talented artists. And I suppose for Bangara, they've also got that idea of like how the, you know, as anyone has seen the shows, the stories that come from the communities and things like that. So that kind of generative story process that comes from that engaged practice. And so making those connections all the way through is a really interesting thing. Um, the other one I just want to mention, and it kind of these are obviously kind of rural and regional focused examples and <laughs> predominantly our work is rural and regional focused. We're based in Brisbane but nearly all of our programs are rural and regional. And these guys um, are US based and I thought might be of interest to some of the folk here. Um, they've been doing some really fantastic um, work that sort of bridges contemporary visual arts with um, rural community engaged arts in a really nice way. And um, they've been using a lot of the software stuff that we've been doing to, I guess, do stuff like map the activity that they've been doing on um, around the US. So they've got a, a year of the uh, 2014 is a year of the rural, um, year of rural arts, and 
So they've kind of got a whole mapping system built through this way. And this kind of reflects some of the technology we're using with the National Digital Platform too. So I want to kind of give you a bit of a, a taste of it here and we'll kind of look at it later. But essentially sort of a way to kind of organize a big data set of knowledge, um, map-based storytelling, and community-generated community storytelling. So they're the two examples I just want to flag to start with. Um, I'm going to go back to this PowerPoint for a minute and talk about, start to talk a little bit about the sector stuff. Um, and go back just a little bit in history, just a couple of years to 2011. So most of us will remember the um, consultation process for national public policy, which took place in 2011. Um, and it was a really interesting time in lots of ways. The, the previous cohort of key producer companies were pretty involved in, and, and David was one of the companies, that, through data, was one of the companies leading this work nationally, um, about getting the sector a, a bit of a voice in the, in the forums around the national pocket policy. And one of the really extraordinary things, I think, is when the discussion paper came out for national pocket policy, it was, it was kind of really, Grounded in lots of ways and some fantastic examples of all our practice. I mean, you can see them all the way through um, in some really strong case studies, and lots of the references were to artists who, you know, either are obviously working in community context or uh, would identify as being arts and cultural development. But there was no mention of community arts and cultural development sector or practice in the whole of the paper, none. And, the, and by contrast, say, there were 39 references to the creative industries um, in the paper. So you get a picture of like how you can be incredibly powerful and influential as a group of people, but quite invisible. And so that's one of the kind of things that's really been a challenge for this sector for a long time. And how to, you know, in appropriate ways kind of build the visibility and the footprint in the sector. So this is a good one, not a bad one, but one's a bonus for um, And I guess, we, uh, as a sector, came together there and talked about a whole lot of different things. The forum was really interesting. It was deliberately about bringing non-arts partners to the table and asking them what was their feedback on the national public policy. Because it was a document that, you know, in a very real way, said, well, the arts is relevant, not just for the arts and for its own value, because that's very important, but it's also important in education, health, environment, a whole stack of other areas. And that, that vision was, you know, incredibly powerful and really exciting, I think, for lots of us in the sector to see that stuff. And, you know, we're, we're in a slightly different frame now, but a lot of that, um, a lot of that thinking isn't as strongly being represented at the moment. So that's, again, something I think we need to kind of talk through this afternoon. Um, and I remember, you know, our, our sector is, very, very good at coming together when it has to, when it's under threat. No, that's the truth. The sector did incredibly well in 2004 when the community arts board was shut down. Mobilised, got active, put incredibly compelling cases as to why that was a bad decision, got it reversed, got an extra $10 million granted to the sector of practice, and has been, you know, really, really solid ground ever since. But in between times, there's not the investment in sector infrastructure and there's not the investment in working together. And, look, and as a practitioner, I completely get that because like the powerful stuff's happening in communities, the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, you know, I also know that like my practice and my experience has lots in common with everyone, but it's very different as well. So like I don't feel uh, I don't feel confident at all talking about other people's practice. So these are kind of things that you know we're sort of dealing with as we try to talk about what it means to have a CACB sector, a lot of people will kind of um, really challenge that idea that there isn't such a thing as sector, they'll just talk about practice and its diversity and all the rest of it. So, for better or for worse, <coughs> that forum strongly advocated for some national infrastructure. And the two key pieces that I wanted, well, and from that, the Australia Council at the same time uh, reviewed its investment in infrastructure amalgamated a lot of other existing investments, so that cost a lot of companies across the country, and pooled that money, put some of it into new key producing companies, so the, the funding for country arts and new companies who are coming into the last round of key producing funding, but also put some money into um, 
digital platform and for a new national agency for the green arts and corporate development sector. And the third piece of infrastructure, you might have already heard about um, John Smith's project CDN and the National Local Government Culture Forum. So it's kind of up and running already, it's got a bit of a profile there. Meeting again, I think, for the third time in Brisbane next week. The guy who was chairing the, um, was the I forgot to skip through a couple of the slides on you. Um, these are just some shots from that forum in Sydney in 2011. And the Fred Cheney who was here at the bottom was the chair of that forum that day. He's a great connector for our sector because he gets it um, in so many ways and now he's kind of chairing the national and local government forum as well. So those people are important for us to kind of be, um, be supporting and to connect you with us and know what this is Fred's really powerful in knowing that like, the best asset we've got as a sector is our stories. Um, and so the process of getting those stories out to the right people and enabling communities to share them in an appropriate way, I think, is really important. Brought in stories of people from across the country. And the whole process of that itself is a great thing of um, showing how the sector can kind of come together and show its presence and, and be effective in that way. Um, and so then, so Australia has to come out with the National Sector Development Initiatives, money for national infrastructure, these are the three things. So, um, I'll do a couple of things now. I want to just update a little bit about Creative Australia to start with, and then I want to finish off with a bit of a conversation about the digital side of stuff that we're all kind of directly involved in. Someone from Creative Australia would, would love to have been here to do this bit themselves, so I'll do it on their behalf. But, um, it's, uh, it's had some support from the Australian Council over the next three years to get established and is just, uh, I think, as of next week, starting its national consultations. So coming around and running to talk to everyone and get some feedback. And a lot of that will be face-to-face -face or through meetings or through forums like this, and some of them will be online. Um, so we'll be relying on all of you guys to get the word out about this stuff and share the web links when they're available and encourage people to have a bit of a say in it. Um, this is where they're up to in terms of vision and mission and, and purpose. And in, in lots of ways, I think it's important to say that when the proposal for Grand Australia, the proposal for the National Digital Platform was conceived, they were kind of conceived as two halves of the one thing in a sense. So it's a, it was a way for the sector to hopefully get a piece of infrastructure that's people based and also some digital stuff for those things to have their own life and identity, but for them to connect in really powerful ways. So they're kind of being developed in parallel, but they're strongly connected. Um, these are the three things that they're currently working on um, in the first three years of their stuff. And, you know, there's nothing clear. But the, just to take a step, so the three companies that kind of led this process were clearly saying, like, it's not appropriate that any of those companies become the new agency, it was about starting something from scratch. And this is why some of this has taken a bit of time, is it's about, um, it's about making sure that this is a new thing that can be owned by everyone and shaped by the sector. Because if it's seen as just being kind of one particular company or agency carrying it through, then it carries all of that baggage with it. So we have to imagine something that's new and relevant to what's happening for us now and in the immediate future, and, and give that a chance to be uh, to become something useful for us. Um, they're applying, they're looking for someone to run it. Uh, Chief Executive Officer. Currently, uh, so I think this uh, is just being advertised as of today. Uh, 19th of March is the deadline. So if anyone knows anyone or is, uh, thinks they the, knows the person for this job, then please um, direct your contact to, to Sue Ann, uh, who's the chairperson. Um, and now I just want to move on, I've got a couple of minutes left just to talk about the digital platform and where that's heading. It's, um, it's really about trying, I think, to address a lot of the kind of opportunities and the challenges of bringing together the value of our sector in new ways. And I think when you try to bring um, our sector together without, uh, without any kind of practice-based focus, and by, by that I mean something like arts and health, or environment or education, it's very difficult because it's so broad. And so a lot of this is about trying to connect the sector through areas of interest or common areas of campaign where people connect around a piece of practice or something that they're actually doing together. So it's very much a practice-based model, 
and where people have got stuff they want to share. An example like the stuff that's been happening in Queensland, pick up Bongo's theme of the uh, disaster recovery work, was kind of creative recovery stuff that was a response to the Queensland floods, and then building that to connect with other artists and organisations like the Victorian Bush Buyers and others internationally who are also in that space. Um, where it makes sense to connect because you've kind of got that shared practice and interest. But you can imagine a whole stack of different streams. Interconnected streams of practice where you um, connect around the things that you want to sh achieve. And so a lot of the idea for the platform really is about the things that, uh, whereas our own websites and things like that are about the things that we do in our work, the platform really is about the idea of the things that we do together, so the things that we couldn't achieve by ourselves. And so that's really where it's trying to key in to support the stuff that you know isn't isn't currently as easy as it should be. Now the technology is going to be important and all the rest of it. We've got a great team of people who are working on this and it's a growing team, but it's not going to be anywhere near as important as the buy-in. Like if people don't have a go, start using it and try stuff out, it's not going to be worth anything. So it's about that kind of investment and getting people to, to turn it into something that's useful. Um, it's underpinned by this idea of a knowledge base of sector's content and then something that we grow over time by contributing to it. And essentially the idea is that like, we create great digital content all the time through our work. If we take it through a system like this, it becomes accessible and grows as a knowledge base that's very easy to share. Now, none of the technology is revolutionary. It's kind of stuff that's been around for a long time, but it's just the will to actually do it and make it something that's accessible and useful. And once the content's in there and people have given their permission to use it, it can be shared in all sorts of different ways for all sorts of different purposes. But actually making the connection and the commitment to use it is the key. I'm going to finish up shortly so I won't get through all, all of these things, but I do just want to touch on um, the work of the working group at the end. Um, <coughs> and I think there's, there's a conversation about um, about the tension between you know competitive business plans and business models and the need to make uh, to generate more income and to do projects that um, are competitive in funding rounds and things like that versus the idea of working together as a sector and those two things don't necessarily fit neatly so how do we um, have the conversation about doing things that are for a broader use and, and the irony for us I think is that like this sector is so brilliant at working in partnership at a local level, all sorts of different partners, all sorts of different people, incredibly considerate. But I don't always see that applied when we're working with each other. And I'm not sure why, why well, I do not But I think it's an interesting conversation for us to have. Why can't we, you know, <coughs> work out ways to collaborate in ways that does grow the play? Because I think, you know, to take one very quick example, when the NBN stuff was rolling out, <coughs> we were interested in the idea of digital inclusion. And the, and the opportunity to improve rural and regional access and make sure that computer capacity was kind of equitable across the country. Now, one company like us going to NBN Co. and the Department of Communications means nothing. Like, you know, not a blip on the radar. But if you connect all of the companies working in digital media across the country who are delivering great product and teaching skills through their work, then all of a sudden, NBN Co. and those guys, oh, actually, that's, that's something we can work with. That's something we can deliver. And that's kind of that's that idea that's underpinning all of this stuff. If we connect as a group around things that we're interested in doing, then we can actually achieve a lot and unlock other kinds of investment that won't be always going back to the Australia Council because they're you know they're going to have their own challenges. Uh, I'll probably finish it there. Um, I, I think the idea of the working group that we're kind of working through at the moment is really interesting, and we might kind of well, we might talk this in the, in the, in the groups as well. But essentially, um, we've tried to, it was designed initially as a, just a steering group for the digital platform, and now it's being conceived of as a working group for the sector, the, the technology working group for the sector. So that in, you know, in three months' time, someone's going to come up with like some other brilliant idea, and rather than that happening in isolation, how can we, through our practice, connect that with this other work that's already happening? in a way that benefits those organisations and others. And I think you can do it. I think you can say, look, there's a bigger thing happening, you're leveraging this idea, and you're turning, building something else new that can do <coughs> capacity of the overall thing. So it's an idea we want to think about as we go through today. 
Thank you very much. That's really, um, really great. I'm really looking forward to talking to you this afternoon.